We have some fans over here, and we are they are fans. We know these people personally. Just the other day, a video caught fire of some magic, of some mysterious man in a cowboy hat. Somebody said it was the cookie monster, the cowboy cookie monster, but it's not. It's our good friend. Let's take a look at the fire he dropped at a DSA rally in Texas. About that a little bit too, because you refuse to fight tooth and nail against the Iron Dome funding. You refuse to stand. Let's talk about it. 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 Because let's let's actually start on that though, right? Because I don't believe in elephants in the room. Yeah, Let's speak on it, because we are all here in solidarity to fight for human rights for Palestinians and Palestinian kids. So if we care about this, my brother, if we care about it, we got to be about it. Yeah. We got to be about it. And when the votes happen, and when the votes happen, they have to... You refuse to face the crowd. You refuse to do anything of value. You're a traitor to the people. I loved it all. You even threw in the Ortega stuff because that shit got me so pissed off. Uh, and we also have one of your comrades here today. We know both these guys very well. Keaton Mansfield, David from, is it UPI? Uh, CPI. CPI. See, I fucking got it. I even, where's my <laughs> note? CPI. These guys are both yeah. from CPI. <laughs> what does it stand for before I butcher it, David? Let people know. Uh, the Center for Political Innovation. That is right. And we got a lot of questions about that. But first, let's unpack this thing. Keaton, my man, I've sat down with you and broke bread in Nicaragua. We had such a great time. We had some amazing conversations. Really, to tell you the truth, it was kind of eye-opening. It was life-changing for some of us, uh, especially that conversation we had after hours uh, with a bunch of friends, just getting your perspective. But let's unpack what happened here with Sandy, your good friend. What was going through your mind? Did you know you were going to do this? Did you prepare yourself for it? Or is this just something that happened, like, inspirationally? Because I saw you going yes with Sandy when she says, hey, brother, we got to be about it. And you were connected there. But then she tried to throw the same bullshit out there, and you once again whacked it down. Unpack what happened over the weekend with this situation. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's good to, good to see both of you again, Pasta and Fiorella. Um, yeah, it was, it was absolutely planned. I was preparing for it. As a matter of fact, I had been in Illinois all of last week, and I wasn't supposed to get back to Austin until yesterday, until Monday, and the event with AOC that I was at was on Sunday. So when I got the notification on my phone that she was going to be in Austin on Sunday, I'm like, all right, I'm cutting the vacations short, packing all my stuff up and making that 13-hour drive back down to Austin so I can be there and I can be there to confront her. And uh, we get in there and really, I mean, you can see that in the video. There really weren't a lot of people, maybe 150, 200 people probably. Um, so, I mean, if anything, I mean, she's supposed to be the progressive queen who can just pull thousands and thousands of crowds. But uh, they, they, you know, she's promising Texas is going to go blue. Texas is going to stay red until that red represents socialism. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I'm a little bit like, okay, so a lot of people um, give you and Caleb hate and the entire CPI organization because there's a lot of conservatives and a lot of conservative social issues that you guys, you know, you accept from other people. Not that the, the whole organization is, but that you accept like spirituality, religion, and just certain stances on things. Uh, how do you, how do you conflate or how do you bring socialism into a sort of conservative viewpoint on social issues as well? Well, I think for me at least, and see, this is, this is the thing that strikes me as so odd. I have known Caleb in person for every bit of six months. I was with him in New York. I mean, we were eating lunch together every day. That man is a, is socially progressive he is very much i mean all these things that they lev levy against him that he's you know whatever he's homophobic he's transphobic he's against abortion they levy at caleb it makes no sense caleb's progressive if anybody i mean i'm the one who no mind you, i'm not i wouldn't consider myself a traditionalist or a conservative but i'm definitely not as much on the the social issues in general 
So when the question comes up of, okay, how do we reconcile maybe more conservative social values with socialism, strikes me as really odd because internationally, the question is how do we reconcile progressivism and liberal social values with socialism? Because China is not a socially liberal country. Cuba is not. Nicaragua definitely is not. It has some of the most strong uh, some of those strong pro-life legislation in yeah. in Latin America. So, I mean, if anything, these around the world, these you know so more conservative uh, social values, cultural values, are pretty much accepted in the norm when it comes to socialism. Yeah. Wow. Boston. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to jump in and ask David a question. I'm sorry, my mic. Oh yeah, go. No, go ahead. So, go David, ahead. I, I just want to piggyback on what uh, Keaton's saying right now because, you know, like like I said, it was like kind of like when you go to the Global South and when you're in Nicaragua and you see the type of socialism that's there, right, the economic socialism, and you can see the people are pretty much like uh, almost like Trumpers that speak Spanish, right? You know, they're very highly religious. They go to church on Sundays. They're not really going to push hard for gay marriage. They're not approving of abortion. Shit, they even suck when it comes to marijuana and whatnot. <laughs> How would you, what would you consider CPI to be? And how would you then sell that brand if it is or if it is not socialism to Americans who look at socialism as, wait, this is way too much authoritarian control. Uh, this is taking away our freedoms. Go ahead and piggyback on that. Yeah, definitely. And to grift off of what uh, Keaton was saying just a second ago, uh, him and I don't agree personally on like social issues, but we're here to work together under the CPI banner to get those issues resolved because we, we, we really feel like class and economic issues, like you're saying, how you saw in Nicaragua, it wasn't social progressivism, but it was socialism economically. And to get those two mergers here, especially in Texas, is something I've been trying to do for the past year. And let me tell you, there's a lot of people here who love the idea of socialism, but they don't even know what it is. They're socialists, but they don't know it yet. They practice this thing. It's called down here, they call it Southern hospitality. But what I like to call it is yolidarity. It's what it really is when it comes down to the day. It, your neighbors helping out neighbors because they see the state isn't going to come in and help me. God knows these private corporations aren't going to come and help me. Why are we going to bicker about these social issues when we can hold people's feet to the fire and get actual real material changes? So even though I am on the social progressive lens and there is a lot of people socially conservative in the CPI, I'm not focused on that. I'm focused on getting real material changes for people where it really matters. And I respect everybody's spiritual beliefs, everybody's social beliefs. It's just, it's a really a matter of talking about material conditions and getting out of the culture war, in my opinion. It's funny you mentioned that about Texas because, you know, having grown up in Florida, having lived in the Midwest, I 100% agree with you. And when I went to Iowa to cover Bernie Sanders, um, there were these very conservative people there that were just talking and gloating about co-ops, but they didn't call them co-ops. They called them something else. And I'm like, oh, this is a very socialist thing you guys are promoting, but I'm not going to tell you that. And, and it's this thing that, that they don't realize what it is. And socialism and communism has been maligned specifically by people like AOC because they're so hyper-focused mm -hmm. on changing the ideology of, of people, like calling everybody that disagrees with them, you know, violent, a right winger, a Nazi, and maligning people. So, it, it, ironically, it just it just pushes people away from from any sort of liking of the term socialism, which the whole thing is just you know workers owning the means of production. It's people's material uh, conditions having uh, them having more of a say in in what their their material conditions are. So, this is to both of you. Do you guys believe? that AOC is controlled opposition, or do you think she's just a weak politician that happened to just win an election and is just a careerist? David, you I, go first. Sure. Uh, I definitely think it started as a weak politician and then is definitely morphed into more of a controlled opposition. If you look at her just trying to 
in the basic sense of trying to min- maintain your job and your stability, uh, notoriety within the Democratic Party. Uh, that would be my personal take on it. What do you got to say, brother? I think, um, you know, when she was on the campaign, it was on and on. Oh, you know, she's just some bartender from or the Bronx, I think. Um, look, she's, you know, a working class queen and she happens to be uh, Latina. So even that, you know, extra points there. But I mean, what was it? Six months ago, eight months ago, it came out that apparently she was somehow involved in the ownership of this bar, if I'm recalling correctly, that she was somehow like a partial owner or something like that in this bar that she bartended at. She went to um, school in Boston, uh, I think at Boston College, if I'm, if I'm remembering correctly. University, yeah. Boston University. And um, she, I think she tried to play herself up as just this, this good old girl from the Bronx who is proving that anybody – you know, if even if, you know, America is just this racist, horrible, uniquely evil government. And but despite all that, you can still be a Latin American woman who can come out of, you know, waiting tables and serving drinks all the way up to the federal Congress building. I don't think that's the case. I think that's how it's portrayed. I mean, it's obviously that's how it's portrayed. But I think from the beginning, there were there, there was the rec- this deep state was recognizing the value and propping someone like her up. Yeah, it's just like that woke CIA commercial they released a couple months ago. (laughs) (laughs) My family's been in the CIA for a long time, and, you know, we buy teddy bears and all this other bullshit. You're the CIA. Give me a break. And that's, you know, (laughs) I I think it's important to always analyze that question. You know, what came first, the chicken and the egg? Was she AOCIA, or did she kind of change there? I think I agree a little bit more with Keaton that she was put there because, you know, we have to pay attention to the mental psyops that our ruling class is thrusting upon us so we can see it coming before it even happens. And I think that, you know, I even fell for it. I went down to her campaign offices and so impressed the way she did things. Um, but let's let's digress back to this question about the solidarity, right? Okay, because, you know, we've been saying this for a long time. Our, our time with Keaton in Nicaragua, our time... With you, David, when we got to see you do that beautiful presentation in California, you know, we saw a different type of socialism, a different type of communism, or whatever you want to classify it, a different type of solidarity, which is more about economics, <laughs> right? Presenting resources, seeing a person like you, Keaton, so different than David on your social issues and stuff, but still the same goal where you can go down to South America and you can even question AOC, hey, you refuse to stand with, uh, with uh, uh, Commandant Ortega, you know, which really pissed me off. You know, it pissed me off from a point of view where people like Tulsi were even silent when the Renaissance Act was coming out. Everybody was so concentrated on Kyle Rittenhouse rather than the economic stranglehold the deep state and the United States and the West were preparing to put on Nicaragua and the people of Nicaragua. But how do you sell that version of solidarity y- y- of sorts of socialism that's more about economics? Especially when a lot of people in the states are so programmed to say, you know, when it comes to socialism and communism, there's too much power. Uh, Marxism at its core uh, actually relies on you eliminating people who think differently than you. There's a lack of freedom of choices. Look what's going on with this medical tyranny now. That's what you'll get with socialism. Keaton, how do you sell that? And then, David, you can piggyback off your brother when Keaton gives his answer. How do you sell a pushback against that narrative right there? Okay, so I think we ought to start with the last one first, and that was the the medical tyranny that we're seeing here in the U.S., that we're seeing up in Canada. China doesn't have a vaccine mandate, and yet more people are vaccinated in China than in the U.S. Explain that. Well, for me, it's pretty simple. The Chinese government, under the leader of the commun- under the leadership of the Communist Party, the Chinese government has earned the trust and the respect of their people. The the Chinese government has not allowed these medical firms to experiment on people, to bribe government officials to get their stuff passed, and they don't operate on a medical profit incentive. They operate for the people, by the people. So I think that's my answer to that, is uh, if I'm remembering correctly, it was either Huey Newton uh, or Fred Hampton who said socialism is the people. And if you're afraid of socialism, you're only afraid of yourself. And so my kind of initial reaction to when I'm trying to think about, okay, how do we really build a pro-socialist or a sympathetic, socialist sympathetic movement 
among the broad masses of people. Well, I kind of have to look back on my own childhood, my own early years of political development, and that's coming from a town of about 800 people in the middle of southern Illinois. And socialism saying, you know, oh, socialism is this, this, this. People turn their, you know, they may like everything that comes after the socialism part. They may agree with it, but they're not going to hear it because they've turned their ears off because the American government has won the culture war. The American government has successfully pushed that socialism is AOC and socialism is all this woke stuff. And to be fair, if I thought AOC was a socialist, if I thought Bernie Sanders was a socialist, I wouldn't like socialism either because those people are trash. But those people aren't socialists, but I can't blame anybody for disliking it. So, I mean, I, I think, Pasta, you and I have discussed this. I have used in the past when talking to people back home the term popular Republican, the idea that we need to have a popular government, a populist government that protects the republic. I mean, it's just like it sounds, a populist republic that is focused on lifting people out of poverty, that's focused on building a strong economy and putting American workers first, not multinational corporations, not bankers and oil monopolists. Yeah, damn straight, man. I think in my personal experience uh, with the organization that I founded, it's a, uh, so affiliated with the CPI called San Angelo Solidarity, is when we first started, we were focused on disaster relief. We weren't focused on this social issue, that social issue. We were focused on just getting out to people in need because our entire town's water supply got poisoned, essentially, and there was no running water in the entire thing. All of it was poisoned with nephilimine, acetone, benzene, all these ridiculous chemical solvents. And basically what we did is we went around and we went to the surrounding towns because it was just like the, when the pandemic started, there was no water on the shelves, no nothing. So we went and we bought up all the water back and forth for about a week until we got stopped down by the big freeze. And we delivered water to working class, uh, disabled, not able to have the ability to go drive to a distribution site or a water center because for one, there was no water on the shelves. And for two, there was only one distribution site way across town. And we didn't discriminate. We didn't open the door and say, hey, uh, who did you vote for? What's, are you a good leftist before we can hand you this water? We just talked to regular people and we, meet, we met their needs directly where they were. We didn't go around virtue signaling or calling for an end to this or an end to that or sitting on our couch doing nothing. We were out there with our feet on the ground seven in the morning till, mid, till midnight driving everywhere to get water to real people. And we weren't talking about these weird issues. We were just getting to people's real material needs. And I personally, that's what I think is not only the cure to getting people in Southern areas, more traditionally, what would you call conservative economically areas to a more socialist position by showing them that this fog of the Cold War that has been fading and fading, it's bullshit. And it's just a mist at this point. And what we have the unique opportunity to do in our lifetimes is to capitalize on that mist fading and showing people that socialism isn't this scary Stalin who wants to collectivize your toothbrush and make sure that you and your neighbors share the same car. No, this socialism is your neighbors helping your neighbors and having a government that actually gives a damn about its populace. And to me, just... Just meeting real people is the answer for one, for the people and for yourselves as organizers, because right now the left is stuck in a state of doom. Uh, this doomerism that perpetuates the left's ideology is poison. It's cancer. And the only way to solve that, in my opinion, in my experience, too, is to actually get off your ass, go organize and do something about it. One of the things that I think has uh made people just completely back away from anything related to socialism or what they deem socialism is a lot of these people that are very arrogant and elitist when it comes to the discussion of theory. I want to hear from you guys. How important is theory? Because yeah, I, I personally believe that reading and, and educating in theory is important. But however, the people the way you have they presented it is extremely, extremely the counter opposite of it. It's extremely just intellectual elitism, where, you know, if somebody comes to them and says, 
for example, the truckers, they didn't like them. They thought they were right-wingers, Nazis, that they weren't real workers, that they were petty bourgeois. And, and they started focusing on all this the theoretical terminology that really had paid zero attention to the material conditions that these people were living. How do you uh, bring in theory and how do you talk to people who are working class, actual working class without, you know, and teach them about theory or talk to them about theoretical things without, but, but also understanding exactly what they're going through. Because most people, you know, if you come up to a random person in the United States right now that are working class and you tell them to go read Marx while they have <laughs> like all these bills to pay and they can't, you know, they're, they're, they're having a hard time paying rent and all this stuff is happening around the world. They're going to tell you to screw off and like to stop talking because you don't know what the hell they're talking like what they're experiencing and i feel like a lot of the left is just very um just finger wags and doesn't really acknowledge the plight that working class people are going through yeah yeah if i could answer this i'd love to uh basically in my experience, I also share the opinion that theory is very important. I mean, our SAS, we started off as a reading group initially, and then we moved into action only after we saw like opportunities that, hey, we need to get up and do something. In that sense, too, I would always tell anybody who is interested in joining SAS, if you ever walk up to somebody uh, talking about socialism and they tell you, oh, you're not a perfect socialist. Mar uh, Mao said this in 1963, and so you're not allowed to be hanging out with us in our group. It's like you need to turn away and run it as far as you can as fast as possible because those people aren't serious about making the real world better. They aren't serious about making material change. They're serious about virtue signaling and elevating their own social position and Facebook for likes. Like, it, it's... It's complete lunacy to me. Like these people, they act like it's a video game. That, that, that's all I can yeah. say. It's, it's not real life to them. It's just a game. So if you if you really want to do shit, you're gonna have to see that when the rubber meets the road, it's not always always as pretty as you would imagine it to be in your fairy tale world. Keaton, you want to piggyback on that and stuff like that? Are you a big believer in theory? Yeah. You got a book of in your po left hand pocket that says. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Jesus Christ is a socialist. My mom read that book. <laughs> <laughs> it's a nice um, mom. No, I, I think, I think, I think David's definitely right. Um, my opinion on the matter might not be the most popular among the left, but I find theory, I find reading Marx and Lenin extremely boring and kind of unengaging. And so if I find it that way, as someone who has been involved in socialist politics for every bit of five, six years, and who is already forced themselves to read a lot of this stuff. What is, you know, Joe Schmo who works on the oil rig going to think when he gets home after work and just wants to have a beer and watch the evening news? He's not, he's not going to read Marx. And that's okay, really, because not everybody who is a socialist has to be a library of information. Not, not everybody who's a socialist has to be a Caleb Maupin who can spit off historical <laughs> facts and theoretical facts off the top of his head, like it's sports statistics. So you can be a sympathizer with socialism, and that's what we need. We, I would rather have 10,000 people who support socialist leaders and support the ideas of socialism without understanding the intricacies of Lenin state and revolution than I would rather have 100 people who understand all these complexities. But you know, I'd, I'd rather have the, the, the broad masses than the intelligentsia, than the intellectuals and the academics on my side. Because quite frankly, it's those people that were the Congress for Cultural Freedom, and it's those people that get used in psyops. It's the Noam Chomsky types that really end up hurting socialism more than helping it. Yeah, and if I could just add one more thing Go to ahead, Pasta's question at the end. I think the biggest help for me personally will have to be my partner, Christina Garcia. I got to shout her out. Because the way she can talk to people about socialism in such, such just a plain Joe Smo language to regular people, that's the only way you're going to get to them. It, that, that's the only little tidbit I wanted to add. You, you just be personal, be friendly, be a socialist. You got to be social first, folks. <laughs> yeah. I, well, I like what you're, I'm picking up what you guys are putting down. I really do. I've always liked when 
I've talked to you guys about this, about concentrating on economics, about the left right now, what's going on in America, the American left. We don't call it, we say there's no left in America, but there is an American left, and they are really some special people and stuff like that. But I'm going to start off this question with you, and Keaton, I want you to start this off and then hand it off to David. If it is so boring and if it is so trite and you don't want to talk about theory, and there are some issues when you talk about theory and you talk about old school socialists, there's a lot of people who say, and this is one you didn't get to, that a lot of old school socialism and Marxism is about eliminating people who think differently than you. You mentioned Xi Jinping over here. I'm not like one of those guys, like, you know, a lot of American conservatives who will point to China for all their problems and think that China's the enemy. But I sure as hell have my, my suspicions about China, especially when it comes to Xi Jinping and his relationship with Klaus Schwab and the World Economic Forum. So two parts, address that, that situation. And then my second part of the question is, why even call it socialism? Why not brand it as populism? Why not talk about it as something else? Because even Caleb, We'll talk about it will be its own United States when it adopts a form of socialism, it will be its own. So why not make those changes now? Well, as far as I'll, I'll take on the China part first, I'm not a scholar of China by any stretch of the imagination. I support them as they lift people out of poverty, but that's about the extent that I know on their intricacies and I know they have involvement with these people. But I think what it gets down to is I am really, for better or for worse, not concerned with what China's doing. I, I'm happy to take their successes and what their, their, their massive gains they've made in raising the, the living standard, earning the trust of their people, and I can recognize that as good. But when there are downsides to what China is doing, such as their involvement with their, their, their support and their, their trading with Israel, I am also just as equally going to criticize them for that. The difference is I don't ever want to say and make points that will cause people to start, as you said, to start blaming China and take China as, as cannon fodder instead of recognizing our own domestic issues and our, inter our, our internal issues here in the United States. I think that's probably the best response I can give you because I do support China. I think China is doing great things, but nobody's perfect. And China is bound to make mistakes. That's we're all human. That's just the reality of things. But as for why still call it socialism? Well, um, I mean, there's for a long time, I, I didn't even have socialist in my in my Twitter bio. As I said, I generally, if someone asks my politics, I'm a popular Republican, because I do think there's there comes a point where we kind of have to recognize that, you know, socialist groups in the US don't have nearly as good of a shot at winning this culture war and winning the information war as the United States government and all its media apparatuses. I cannot put out content. Caleb cannot put out content. Everyone here cannot put out content that is going to get more views and more funding and more engagement than CNN, Fox, MSNBC, and all the, the, the corporate media. So I, I would be okay with if we were to use something a term other than socialism, but still maintains those core economic principles. I'd be okay with that. I would support that, but it does set a dangerous precedence, Pasta, because if we're going to just jump ship on our name every time it gets demonized, we're going to have to change names every two years, and it's going to start seeming like we're deceiving people. And people hate being deceived, especially when it comes to politics. And we have to make we have to be honest about who we are. We have to be honest about what we believe. David, go ahead. For sure, yeah. And I think just to go off of what Keaton was saying with the whole deceit thing, it's I'm not saying China is saints or anything to that stretch of the imagination, but the right now, I think it's very obvious to everybody on this panel the tensions right now going on in the world between the West and Russia and Ukraine and the potential block between China and Russia, that there is, a, I wouldn't say just complete out and out disinformation, but there is extreme muddying of the waters on both sides. I'm not going to say China is the perfect Satan in this case and in any means whatsoever. And to, as Keaton said, I'm not, an, I'm not a scholar on China. I, I do support their initiatives to try to uplift Africa and uplift the Middle East and trying to expand trade routes and trying to create a multipolar world. 
and I'm not going to cheerlead for anybody. I'm I'm a Marxist. I'm a ruthless critic of that all of all that exists. So I'm definitely not here to cheerlead. And in that sense, I think we should definitely support them against a war uh, like Cold War 2.0 that has been brewing up. Even if we don't, if we only have these misgivings with China and the way they've been operating recently, which I will happily criticize them on things like Israel too and stuff like that. Um, in the second part of your question, um, I'm sorry, sir, could you repeat the second part of it? Well, the, the second part is why don't we, and I, let, let me tell you oh. something. I love the answer that Keaton gave is why don't we reband socialism to more of a, 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 a name that would fit better with the programmed Americans, you know what I'm saying? That as soon as mm. they hear the question, I mean, I think Fee even kind of mentioned the fact that when she came to the country, that question's there. Are you any way affiliated with the Communist Party whatsoever? <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Like, well, why don't we rebrand that to a populist name? Because, and, and Keaton explained it beautifully, but I want to know why. Because me personally, I always push for a mixed economy, right? I want to take the best of socialism, the best of communism, the choices of capitalism, the, the uh, freedom of speech of the libertarianism, and form one thing that fits everything and leave all the crap behind. So why don't you answer the question about you even said yourself, it's more like populism. Why don't we brand it as populism? Yeah, that's a really interesting point that you actually bring up because I've actually had this conversation with the group member before whenever they were looking into the group, newer to it, and they thought, you know, we're in a very conservative area, you know, small town, medium-sized town in Texas. And they were like, you know, why don't we just do everything we do and just not call it socialism? And, and I had to think about that for a hard minute. And I really, in the conclusion I came down to with it is, well, there's been so many people who have fought and died for this word, for this movement, for these goals. It just felt really disrespectful for me to say, yeah, I'm going to take everything that y'all have done and use it, but I'm also going to cross out all of y'all's names and not associate myself with y'all. So it's not a, it's probably not the best answer in the world, but I just feel like personally, it's a title that is being re rehabilitated as we speak with the fog of the Cold War lifting. And it is something that can have traction again and something that shouldn't be abandoned basis on the basis of so many people who have fallen for it. Um. You know, I, I adhere to the, the communist ideology as well. But one of the things that I find off-putting and one of the things that I think a lot of people find off-putting with it is this idea that it has to be biblical. Like, it becomes this sort of obsession with spirituality, it, like like the, like this religious, like, um, fundamentalism of, mm. of, like, the way some, some Marxists, and, and self-declared Marxists, I think a lot of the people in the United States who call themselves uh, communists or socialists aren't really that. They're just confused liberals, but that's just my <laughs> opinion, just based on what I'm seeing. But, um, but it, 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 they just kind of obsess with it, and they're like, well, if Marx didn't say this, so this can't be. And they don't apply that theory to today's reality, meaning, like, that it's just theoretical. That there's no like applications to the now, and that's my biggest problem. Is that there's, like, for instance, the surveillance state is something that, no, no, none of these people could have possibly considered really because it was so long ago, and the conditions, the material conditions, were different. You know, there was a lot of reference to feudalism, a lot of reference to that. But now, what's happening today with the surveillance state is you have. The government, you know, having which is made up of, in, at least in this country, of corporations and the one percent and and this oligarchy that we live in. But you also have the technocratic world, this technocratic panopticon that we're living in, where you, you're seeing what's happening in Canada, where now they're going to freeze people's bank accounts and and take away people's money and insurance just just because of what they believe in. So there's this this a fascism and this authoritarianism that is a very, a very kind of invisible enemy because it's, it's based in technology. That's not something that's in any sort of theoretical book. You could apply some of it to it, but it's not really out there. How do you guys plan on dealing with that and growing something like CPI amidst this sort of it, like ever increasing surveillance state? 
Well, at uh, Fiorella, I was just probably two hours ago talking to the head of our, our youth branch of CPI here in Austin. And he and I were joking. And I said that uh, these, especially the land back, the, uh, the land back Marxists would make the best damn Christians the United States has ever seen. Um, only problem is they're atheists, but hey, yeah. you know, but you know, it, it raises a very interesting point because Marx didn't predict security cameras, as far as I know. Lenin didn't, Stalin didn't, but we have to deal with them now. So that is, that, I mean, that's something obviously you're bringing the question up that we've got to start preparing for because in the case of freezing bank transfers, you know, we have that happening right now on an international level with Afghanistan where Biden has frozen the now sovereign government of Afghanistan, whether you like it or not, the new government of Afghanistan is the legitimate government. And now he's going to give that money to 9-11 victims. Sure, we should give money to 9-11 victims, but it was Saudi Arabia's fault that the towers got hit in the first place. So why don't we freeze some of their money and give it to the victims instead of these poor these poor Afghans who are starving to death because of the, the last 20 years of war and bombing? How do we combat that? Because socialists, CPI, CPUSA, Workers World, PSL, does not have the technological capabilities to compete on the same level as the United States government does. We don't have giant server rooms. We don't have hundreds and hundreds of, of probably thousands of internet technology nerds just sitting at their computers all day working these things out. It's, it's putting us in a really tight situation and a, a tight bind, and that's why we have to rely on populism. That's why we have to rely on the fact that there are more of us than there are of them, and our only hope for victory is mass movements of civil disobedience, of peaceful demonstrations, of confronting politicians, and demanding our voices be heard in the government. Damn straight, man. The only way we're ever going to get this done is if we have the mass of broad working people on our side. We're not going to get to them by saying, culture war this, culture war that. We're going to get to them by showing them that, hey, this isn't the, the surveillance on you isn't a left right issue. This is a freedom issue. This is a privacy issue. I mean, nobody wants their privacy invaded in the ways that the government is doing. And good Lord knows what, 50 years, 75 years down the line, how complex their systems are going to be. So if we don't but nip this in the butt now, it's going to spiral into a con out of control measure that I really don't want to be alive to see, to be honest. Too late. We're already there. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> Too late. Yeah. Do you have any last questions? Because I have one last simple question for these gentlemen over here. No, go ahead. David, start first. Do you stand with the truckers? Yes. Keaton. My dad is a trucker. My, my uncles are truckers. My best friend's dad is a trucker. You are absolutely correct, Pasta. I stand with them. I hope to see them come to the U.S. If they do, you better bet that I'm going to be out there helping them, getting footage. We're going to see this thing succeed. Freedom Convoy forever. That's the answer I kind of agree with. You know, I'm there too as well. It's put the, the ideology aside and let's stand up for what's right and let's do the right thing. And it's an economic yeah. movement. It's a workers movement. And I'm glad that you guys are there on that. Yeah, we definitely just need to show these workers that they have power. That's my main concern. Exactly, exactly. If we don't get it, shut it down. They're showing us the blueprint. Um, so that's it, guys. Thank you so much for hanging on in there, David. I know we... Uh, Put you off a couple of times, but I'm glad you can come back on. And it was great to speak to you and Keaton. Uh, I love the work you guys are doing. Can you tell people where they can go find your information? Keaton, you start off and David, you finish on up. And where people can find more information about CPI. And hopefully <coughs> Caleb was uh, okay the fact that we didn't throw you too much into the frying pan today. <laughs> my, my social medias are my name. It's K-E-A-T-E-N Mansfield, exactly as it sounds. Thank you. Twitter, YouTube, whatever. Cool. For me, it's uh, San Angelo Solidarity on Facebook, Solidarity Said on YouTube, and San Angelo Solid One on Twitter. And thank you both, David. Thank you for doing the work you're doing. That's, you know, straight up like local organizing. We need more of that. And Keaton, thank you for 
pushing and, and bringing up those questions to, to members of Congress, because most people don't, and, and taking all the hate you did from her sycophants. So thank you so much, both of you, for coming on. We really appreciate it, and we'd be happy to have you on again. Yeah, thank you all. Y'all take it easy. You too. Bye, guys. Y'all are dirty there for you, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> there he is, David and Keaton, man. Oh, wow.